Ah, skin, you guys are feeling the relief of seeing some epidermis. But don't get too relieved, because it's still a spindle cell tumor. I know spindle cell tumors are hard. I did a fellowship in it, and I've been doing this for almost 10 years, and I still struggle with them all the time. What's this? Is that kind of like the story form pattern? Oh, that is exactly like the story form pattern. This is the story form to break all other story forms. Like, oh, I just, I gotta go home now. I know it's only like 7.50 in the morning, but I can't do any more work today. It's such an incredible pattern. And uh, so uh, so fascinating to look at. So you can use a uh, hundred different words to describe story form, but the only way to really learn it is just look at that. That's the picture. That's what story form is. It's swirling, whirling, stirred with a spoon, um, cartwheeling, pinwheeling. You, that the people have tried so many different ways to describe it because no word captures this it really fascinating pattern where the cells are all stacked up in little lines that kind of then whirl and swirl around each other. Very bland, thin, elongated spindle cells, right? And sometimes I, I kind of think that the way that these cells are is that they're kind of like a plate that if you look at them on one surface, they're very thin and narrow. But if you flip them 90 degrees, then they look more like an oval, right? So they're like flat like pancakes, okay? Kind of like oval shaped pancakes. So several different tumors uh, can do that, where, where you can have kind of a story form pattern and you can have cells that are very thin or are kind of more oval. So what do you guys think this is? I'll go back to lower power. There's more of that story form. Yeah, that's like really the most, the most perfect example of story form. I mean, one of the best I've ever seen. And then here's the... A DFSP. So what's this? This is DFSP, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. No tricks here. Now, when you see this, that last case I showed you, doesn't really look much like a DFSP, but I promise you, I have seen some where it would be real easy to make a mistake because of the extensive fat trapping and more spindly looking uh, diffuse neurofibromas with fat entrapment can very much look like this. I've not seen diffuse neurofibromas make good story form pattern, like, like striking story form pattern like this. I, they can swirl a little bit, but, but this is pretty dramatic. Now, the other thing, so what other things might come in the differential here for DFSP? This is, oh, I'm sorry, let me say the features first. Bland spindle cells, often with a story form pattern, and entrapment, honeycomb pattern of fat entrapment like this. And it's very clean, right? The fat is like, like just imprisoned within the DFSP cells, and there's not really much inflammation or fat necrosis or anything. Um, this is the very classic uh, example of how DFSP invades. It just fills in the fat, and look, the fat entrapment's not only happening there, it's all of this. This all used to be pristine subcutaneous, you know, real estate here. It was all fat, all the way up to here, right? Like right there is where the dermis ends, right around here, and the subcutis begins. And if you're not sure about it, you go and look for the eccrine glands. Because eccrine coils, they reside at the deep, in the deep dermis, uh, or the superficial subcutis at the dermal sub-Q junction, right? So wherever you find your eccrine coils, that's where, right around where the subcutis should have started. And so you can see evidence of it right there. And so even though this area here might have almost no fat in it, this all used to be fat. So that is one of the tricky things is sometimes DFSP can extensively infiltrate the fat to the point that almost no fat remains. It just wipes it all out. And only at the very edge will you see a few little islands of, of entrapped adipocytes. So like right here, right? So even though that doesn't look honeycomb, oh, that's great for DFSP because you know that this area should be all fat based on what the stuff I just showed you, but it's not fat. It's been totally overrun by spindle cell tumor, okay? So in this case, it's very, it's a very good because we do have honeycomb down here, but I've definitely seen multiple DFSPs where you'll only find like, like this, a couple little islands of stranded fat. And that confused me when I first saw that. So that's why I'm pointing it out. Okay, so what other things can come in the differential with DFSP? Dermatofibroma? Yeah, dermatofibroma. Now, usually it's pretty easy to tell dermatofibroma and DFSP apart. On H&E only, you can use stains if you want. CD34 will be strong diffuse positive in the vast majority of DFSPs with some rare exceptions. Um, and and the, when there's higher grade fibrosarcomatous transformation, those uh, sometimes lose a 34 expression. They don't have to. 
So, but otherwise, dermatofibromas tend to have epidermal hyperplasia over them and acanthosis uh, or induction of the epidermis, whereas DFSP usually does not have that, although I've seen some that did, um, and those are confusing. Dermatofibromas tend to have more plump, larger cells with more abundant cytoplasm, more rounded nuclei, sometimes with some atypia. So paradoxically, if you see scattered atypia, that points to dermatofibroma rather than DFSP. DFSP should be bland, monotonous, very elongated, thin spindle cells like that because it's a translocation sarcoma, right? And so all the cells look the same, okay? And the other thing is that you often find uh, hemorrhage or blood-filled spaces, hemosiderin, foam cells, multinucleated giant cells, including two-ton giant cells. All of those things are features of dermatofibroma, not DFSP. You can see pigment in DFSP sometimes, but it's not hemosiderin. It's melanin usually. And what is that called? A DFSP with melanin pigment, with pigmented dendritic, like melanocytic-looking cells in them. Yeah, that's called a Bednar tumor, which is just a just a pigmented variant of, of a melanin um, uh, a melanin pigmented DFSP. It's just a, a fancy name for us as pathologists to recognize. It doesn't mean anything different clinically to my knowledge. Okay. Another thing I didn't talk about is collagen trapping, which is a common finding in dermatofibroma, but you can't rely on it because, look, we got some nice collagen trapping in this dermatofibrous sarcoma for two brands. Really good. Usually DFSP doesn't quite trap uh, collagen like this. This is this is the type of collagen trapping we usually see in dermatofibroma, and uh, but you can sometimes see it in dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. So it is a, a common finding of DF, but do recognize that it can be seen in uh, DFSP also. I find the other features, the blood, hemosiderin, foam cells, um, and fatter, plumper nuclei with atypia, to be the most helpful things. All of those are really good pointers towards dermatofibroma and away from DFSP. And again, in hard cases, you can do a CD34. You can also use factor 13A. I don't personally like it for spindle cell tumors. R really, I, I, basic, I rarely use factor 13A. I personally don't find it very helpful. It will stain a lot of dendritic cells in the midst of a dermatofibroma and is usually pretty negative um, uh, in the middle of a DFSP, but I find it a lot, uh, not very specific. It stains lots of different things. Just if, you, if you're watching this at home and you use factor 13A, that's okay, but don't think that everything that's factor 13A positive is a dermatofibroma. That is definitely not true. So, um, okay, so that's one differential. Any other differentials that we can come up with? And also I told you diffuse neurofibroma can mimic DFSP sometimes. Anything else? Like a mangio. Oh. Well, I'll tell you. Mangiocarycytoma? Go say, go, go say it. Yeah. Solitary fibrous tumor, which used to be called hemangiopericytoma, um, can sometimes, it usually doesn't have quite, um, like it, it has kind of more of a patternless pattern. I mean, the spindle cells are just kind of haphazard, but um, occasionally it can make little fascicles or have some areas that get a little swirly. The important thing to know about why those can look alike is that DFSP often has dilated ectatic vessels. Here we have some dilated vessels here, but sometimes they can be dilated and branching and give that staghorn appearance, um, which is the classic vascular pattern seen in solitary fibrous tumor, um, and which it's called the hemangiopericytic vascular pattern because that is what SFT used to be called. Um, and they both express CD34. So uh, solitary fibrous tumor is very, very rare in the skin. Most of the cases I've seen are in the, the deep soft tissue, but it can rarely present in the skin. It usually, almost all of the ones that I've seen are very circumscribed and not infiltrative, but sometimes there is a variant of SFT that has fat in it. It makes its own fat. It's like called lipomatous SFT. And I've, I've never seen one of those in the skin, but I could see that easily being um, uh, mistaken for DFSP. And because they kind of similar cytology to some extent that cells of SFT are usually a little more plump and not quite so thin and stretched out, but I've seen some exceptions. And then the, the what's a good solution though? Does anyone know a, a specific marker for solitary fibrous tumor? Because CD34 is a great marker for certain things, very sensitive for certain entities like DFSP, but it's not specific, right? CD34 stains lots of lots of things. Many, many different fibroblastic tumors will be CD34 positive. Um, and also of course, most vascular tumors with some exceptions. But um, so it, it works, uh, but you have to know exactly what your differential is and to remember that many things express CD34. So what's a more specific marker for solitary fibrous tumor that would be negative in DFSP? 
So STAT6, okay, S-T-A-T-6. And that's because solitary fibrous tumor is also a translocation tumor. It's not a not a sarcoma per se. There's both a low low risk, medium risk, and high risk variants of SFT. We it doesn't really fit neatly into a benign versus malignant box. So there's a way we again this is probably outside the scope of what you guys need to know. But there's a risk stratification method that we can use based on the age of the person, the size, how many mitoses, and if it has necrosis. And then there are ones that fall into the low risk group, basically usually act benign. And then the ones in the high risk group act like like sarcomas, and then the intermediate group is kind of in between. So that's kind of a newer model, even since I was in training. But I actually like that for solitary fibrous tumor. Um, so if you ever have one of these in practice, they should get removed with negative margins, and and someone should be giving you a risk scoring. If they don't, you probably should get a consult to make sure. Um, but STAT six, they their translocation is NAB two STAT six uh, gene fusion or or balanced translocation. And uh, this is one of those times where actually the immunostain STAT6 works better than the fish. My understanding is that the, when the fish rearranges, the, the loci are very close to their original location, so it's harder to see the break apart. I'm not a fish expert, but basically the immunostain works beautifully. It's a strong nuclear stain, and it's pretty specific. I mean, nothing's perfect, but it's pretty specific for solitary fibrous tumor. and be negative in DFSP. The other thing that I would point out as being, and there are a handful of others, but we won't go all the way into them, but the other thing to remember is perineuriomas also uh, can look quite like um, a DFSP because the whirling, swirling growth of perineurioma can look a lot like the story form pattern of dermatofibrous sarcoma for two brands. Uh, perineuriomas can express CD34. They will express perineurial markers, EMA, GLUT1, and Claudin1. The problem is, is they often are kind of finicky, patchy, weak staining perineuriomas. So I find all of those markers, none of them work totally perfectly. Um, EMA particularly, I've had really a hard time. Like it's the classic marker that should be positive in all perineuriomas, but it's very difficult to work. It works great on epithelioid tumors, but on spindly tumors like perineurioma, I find it to be very wispy and weak and difficult to interpret a lot of times, at least in my hands. I've heard that something to do, I think, with uh, different levels of antigen retrieval. There's something in the laboratory you can do to tweak it, but I've not experimented with that uh, personally. But I've heard from some people that they've gotten their EMA to work better by, by I think, doing a different type of antigen retrieval. I, I can't remember the details, but someone told me that not long ago. Anyway, um, the, uh, the, oh, so the thing about that though is that sometimes perineurioma and DFSP can have overlap because DFSP occasionally can have some focal EMA expression or can have some, some staining that's a little bit like a perineurioma. If there's any doubt, you can do fish. And of course, you guys know what's the translocation here. 1722. Mm -hmm. And what are the genes involved? 1722. PDGF beta and collagen 1A1. Yeah, collagen 1A1, PDGF B. B as in boy, B as in beta. And then more recently, it's been discovered, the vast majority have that fusion, but recently in the past few years, we've discovered, uh, it's been reported that there is an alternate fusion involving the PDGFD, D as in delta, um, and uh, fused with a couple of different partner genes. And I've, I've seen one of those in practice, and we're actually in the process of uh, writing that up as a case report. So hopefully that'll be out um, in the near future. So just to know that um, it's... Uh, the collagen 101 PDGFB is really important, but there is a new fusion PDGFD um, that's been described. And I imagine that now that we know that exists, we'll find more and more of those over time. So I don't, I only do the fish in really difficult cases. Uh, this case is classic and you probably could sign that out on H&E, honestly.